actions can companies take to become more inclusive and environmentally exemplary? And how can women be a part of leading that change? Those are two important questions that our panel is going to answer. I'm very pleased to introduce Cynthia Eluzos. She's the CEO of the Women's Voices and Charity Media. And the panelists of her session will be introduced by her. Let's give a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> So thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, yes, my name is Cynthia Iluz. I'm the founder of a media, a French media called the Women's Voices. We aim to amplify uh, women's voices in the global news. And uh, I am thrilled to be uh, also a media partner at the, the Women's Forum. So uh, thank you, Anne-Gabrielle Elbronner. I'm very uh, happy to be here in uh, Washington for the first Women's Forum in uh, the USA. Um, as the topic is um, to connect today, uh, please feel free to connect me also on LinkedIn if uh, you want to amplify your voice. Um, we're going to continue the conversation, um, as you just mentioned, regarding uh, the place of uh, companies on sustainability. So um, first I will introduce our uh, speakers on that uh, topic. Uh, Claudia Berger, you are a sustainability director at Equans. Rick Sandra Kana, are you a partner at Steptoe and Johnson? And Benedict Canston, you head of communication and public affairs at uh, Zurich Insurance. I will address you my first question, uh, Benedict. What are the main environmental challenges in your sector? Um, hi, everyone. Um, First, I'd like to thank um, the organization, you, Cynthia, um, all the Women's Forum teams and the Vital Voices teams uh, to be here. It's a true honor to speak after all these great women, um, and I feel very humble in a very big seat with a very big mic, um, and I'm not tall, so that's very big. Anyway, um, uh, to answer the question, um, so I represent the insurance industry. Uh, which you might say is um, a kind of a boring industry, at least a very discreet one. Um, but we're not boring when it comes to climate um, uh, and to carry risk. Uh, the challenges we face basically are the challenges the society faces uh, because insurance has always echoed um, the, the society's challenges uh, and ever since we've existed, for Zurich it's been 150 years, We've embraced those challenges. We've mentioned a lot since this morning. Um, it can be war, it can be geopolitical threats, it can be inflation, it can be um, purchasing power, and it can be climate. Um, uh, so when we talk about uh, a climate change, um, the numbers of incidents are raising. We've uh, have been uh, a lot of them lately. The intensity and the strength of incident is raising. So undergoing this climate transition is basically the best insurance there is to prevent uh, the impact of uh, climate risk. Um, and insurance has um, literally provided a safety net um, towards climate change, but the net is not infinite. Um, and it's very important more than ever that we act today not to sacrifice tomorrow, um, meaning that we raise awareness, that's our mission every day, prevention, to build the resilience of the organization we support and um, uh, help um, in our everyday mission. Claudia, you have um, also uh, big challenges in your industry. Yes, I'm, uh, I was hearing you and uh, we, we definitely share uh, similar challenges and as uh, you, I'd like to uh, thank uh, the organization for inviting us. It's been a great day so far. <laughs> so, but uh, as far as uh, environmental challenges, uh, 
one, well, we're in the, the service and the, the facilities management and uh, infrastructures uh, management industry. So like we we manage and we operate physical assets and also uh, also energy systems, so quite different than what you, you do. That being said, we, we share a common challenge that is uh, decarbonation, uh, decarbonation for our own operation, but also for the different services that we uh, we offer to our client. And we, we always need to keep in mind that building operations Operation account for it's like 24 uh, 25 percent of the all greenhouse gases uh, production globally uh, globally uh, and and yearly so we definitely need to uh, to lower of course and to take like significant step to lower our own carbon uh, carbon footprint but also uh, we need to help our clients transition toward the uh, low uh, low carbon economy so that's one challenge that uh, that we have. Uh, the other one is really uh, regarding everything to uh, regarding technologies and uh, innovation. So uh, in our field, if we we want to remain competitive, we we need to make sure that we are at the the front, front, forefront of everything related to uh, technology and innovation. Uh, but the, the 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 problem with that is that like all those technologies and those nice performance equipments, they they come with a lot of different uh, environmental challenges, resources extraction, uh, generation of e-waste. So we we need to to make sure that we look at the all the uh, life cycle analysis when we we deliver those type of uh, of solution and another one we share is everything related to uh, to resilience um, in our business it's really really critical to maintain all the uh, the operation all the times in the buildings so we we need to to become more resilient and for us it's really addressing like all the the disruption on the energy markets uh, and the other point also facing all the the climate events that we're going to get that are gonna get more frequent and also uh, more more intense with time so <laughs> Thank you. Ruxandra, um, as a lawyer perspective, you have to redefine a lot of uh, things, such as SDG, we're talking about CSR. Uh, what are your points on this? specific words. Yep. Thank you, Cynthia. And again, also thank you to, uh, to Women's Forum and the Vital Voices for inviting us. Indeed, as a lawyer, uh, I cannot speak about concepts without defining them. Um, so my role, uh, one of my roles for this panel is indeed to define what is E, what is S, and what is G, and um, what they mean for our clients and how our clients maybe position themselves towards uh, the, the respective concepts. So E obviously stands for in environment, but it's not one dimension. Environment can mean anything from climate to pollution to water use to agriculture and waste. Um, S stands for social, and uh, if we are talking maybe 10, 15 years ago, that would have been primarily maybe a non-discrimination um, at the working place um, employment. It has developed to mean diversity and inclusion, so inclusion is now recognized as separate from the diversity concept, and it has developed to um, also cover forced labor, more and more uh, prominent, and support supply chain due diligence. And G uh, stands for governance. And uh, for our clients, uh, their challenge, rather, is how to integrate um, objectives which are not immediately or necessarily profit uh, related into their corporate goals. And uh, we see more and more a, a struggle between those two concepts, companies who need to d deliver uh, profits for their stakeholders and the same companies who are trying to integrate ESG goals into their commitments. Thank you for um, those words. Um, as uh, we already talk about the concept and the definition, I'd like to go uh, more on concrete actions. Uh, for example, Benedict, what are the concrete action and policy that you are implemented? Um, well, um, literally, uh, being a company, a sustainable company, means that you care for the planet. Um, there's no news under the sun. Um, <laughs> but, but when it comes... Um, 
being an insurance um, a company, how do we do? Uh, we're not an industry in the, in the meaning that we don't produce goods uh, and we don't have um, um, uh, 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 like a producing chain where we can intervene and trigger um, um, to to actually be sustainable. So what do we do? We do what we always did. We are pioneers. Um, 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 ESG is three letters, and we have a three-pillar strategy. Um, planet, um, customers, and people. Um, when it comes to the planet, it's speeding up emissions reduction. Uh, being a pioneer in uh, emissions reduction is setting very high standards to inspire um, our whole ecosystem. And for instance, we've reduced by 70% since 2019 uh, our emissions, and we uh, are uh, aiming at a net zero, um, uh, being at a net zero by 2030, 20 years ahead of our targets. So that's how we set a, a, a high standard uh, to inspire our customers. Um, uh, our role as an insurer is uh, actually twofold. We are a risk carrier, so being we carry the risk and we help supporting uh, the transformation of models and innovation within our customers. But we're also an investor and we but through our, our investments, sorry, we can definitely shape the economic and social landscape of tomorrow, investing in green funds, in meaningful uh, funds, for instance. Um, and I come to the second pillar, our customers uh, are inspired by uh, our own behavior, uh, and that way we can definitely support their ener energy transition plans uh, and help uh, companies, institutions, the communities we serve, all around the world to better manage their climate risk. And I come to people, last but not least, it's the center of everything. Uh, like you said, Roxana, there, um, um, ESG is not only about climate, it's about how we interact with our environment. And we as a company put people at the center of everything. Once again, without our people, we cannot be an insurer company. Um, and it's the way we treat our employees. We grow with them. We make their talents grow. Uh, we foster diversity and inclusion in the workplace. And I think uh, we've heard lots um, of good things about how uh, on a political government level uh, we can do and act, uh, how NGOs can act, how individuals and very inspirational leaders can act, but I think the workplace, employers all around the globe should um, carry <laughs> this uh, people engagement and it's not about words uh, on a sheet of paper, it's about how they mean to you and I can say for the first time when I entered Zurich um, not that long ago that being a woman was okay. Um, I was not a trophy, um, <laughs> uh, uh, I put on a shelf, I was not someone in the middle, uh, in the way. I was just um, a woman and it was okay. And for the first time in my life, um, um, I mean, of course, there are still things to improve, but and um, uh, I really think uh, Zurich set an example uh, along the way. For the first time in my life, if I may just give my little example as a silent voice, uh, but probably as vital as all the voices we've heard today, uh, because we're millions of uh, silent voices, um, I didn't get to choose between being a mother or a leader, between my family or my team, uh, between my work or my household. Um, I could get uh, to be both, um, and I could reconcile both um, my ambition and uh, the love for my family and my children. And this is something at Zurich that is very important, is that it's okay to be a woman, it's okay to have great ideas, you can put them on the table, they'll be heard, um, but we're also pragmatic. I mean, um, diverse minds <laughs> foster um, uh, innovation, they feed the success of a company, and I think being pragmatic in the workplace is very important. I mean, we set simple goals for managers, for employees, on the annual uh, goal, goal sheets for everyone. If you don't uh, support um, your team or your colleagues uh, as, as diverse as they are, uh, well, you don't get your bonus. 
or the full uh, bonus at the end of the year. And that's something people understand. Um, and that's the way corporate might lead um, 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 the change and inspire, I think, other uh, people. And Zurich, obviously, is one of the many companies that set a very benefic um, environment in the workplace. Thank you for those personal insights also. Um, I uh, go back to you, Claudia. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, one of the big challenge for you is decarbonization. Uh, can you share with us all the concrete action that you uh, implement today? Yeah, well, um, as you said, like uh, all the decarbonation is really an integral part also of our CSR strategy because it's, it is such a, a big uh, challenge for uh, for us, for our own carbon footprint. So we're aligning, uh, we have the same ambition to, to become a net zero uh, for our own carbon footprint, but where we, we can have the biggest impact is definitely all the, the services and all the, uh, we, we can offer with our clients. Uh, so we offer different services, including decarbonation. So it goes from uh, energy efficiency to performance equipment to, uh, advice on the renewable uh, sourcing. So we offer all those services so they, they can transition uh, them to, to a lower carbon economy. So that's really where we we have uh, the, the biggest impact and that's why we include it in our, our CSR strategy. Uh, but we also have another pillar a bit like you uh, about our teams. Uh, so we, we are committed, uh, our, our CSR strategy is called impact. <laughs> so we, we want to have an impact on our teams. And a big part of that, of course, concerns uh, diversity and, uh, and inclusion, and especially gender equality. Because I'm in a technical business where we're below 20 20% 20 of women. Uh, and we really need to take action to, of course, increase that, uh, that level. So it, it goes uh, with having different, of course, different uh, trainings. Uh, about uh, about sexism, but also hosting different activities for uh, for for networking and um, about that. There's an expression that we heard yesterday at the uh, at the speakers diner about like radical collaboration, uh, and I find it so important that we we do it internally uh, when we're not so many women in a field. Uh, but it's also important to try to include like all the allies we, we have when we're in a really male, uh, male dominated uh, business uh, to make sure that we also collaborate radically with all of them internally so we, we can promote uh, everybody, so. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Ruxandra, when we're talking about sustainability, we're talking about environment, but we're talking also about uh, people, about gender equality. Uh, so. What are you thinking about it uh, in a lawyer perspective? Thank you. So um, the legal industry, I think, is different from uh, other industries in the sense that we, uh, by nature, respond um, immediately to client um, expectations. So uh, maybe what I would like to emphasize from the legal industry perspective is that uh, obviously all law firms uh, have uh, and had um, different um, parameters and different objectives in terms of gender parity. Uh, again, if we talked uh, 10 years ago, we would have talked about how uh, what percentage of women were lawyers in a law firm. Well, our clients have actually forced us and we responded to go and be a little bit more granular. It's not only what percentage of women are lawyers, but what percentage of women are uh, partners, and then what percentage of women are senior partners. Um, the next level of granularity was, uh, okay, you have women on certain firm committees. Which firm committees are all the women in those committees which maybe are not necessarily decision-making uh, fora. Uh, and we had to respond to, uh, to uh, questionnaires from our clients, which went more and more granular, and we had to change as a result of, of that. So maybe the, the two points that I wanted to make are, A, 
we should not underestimate the impact of business partners on changes, and B, that we should not necessarily stop at a, a surface percentage uh, or numbers, but should be more granular in terms of the actual role that women play in organizations. And uh, maybe to share um, a short um, personal story as well, uh, I was asked uh, a few years ago to uh, become, uh, to have a function in the law firm, a managing function. And um, my uh, immediate reaction, probably not really thought through, was, okay, yes, what do you expect from me? And, uh, and the answer was very empowering. And the answer was, I don't know. It's for you to tell us what you want to do in that position. And, uh, and I've then applied that answer to other positions that uh, I've taken. So, uh, so it's empowering employees and individuals in organization, not necessarily to fit a role, but to actually uh, shape that role for themselves as well. Thank you, Benedict. Um, a question about the future and maybe uh, the hope that you have regarding sustainability um, in the following months or years uh, concerning your company and your project. Um, I am thinking of one um, concrete example. We're talking about concrete yeah. <laughs> actions in this session um, that Zurich is leading is the, called the Zurich Forest Project. And it's a collaboration uh, with a nonprofit, uh, the Brazilian nonprofit called Instituto Terra, uh, founded by Sebastião Salgado, the great photographer. I don't know if you've um, uh, heard of him, and his wife. <laughs> um, um, and she has a, a major role to play um, in his uh, um, ast uh, artistic career, uh, but also in them, in in that project. Um, and. Um, talking about this um, for two reasons. One, because it's a tangible example of what uh, a company can do um, and achieve uh, when it wants it wants to address um, uh, climate change. Um, it's, and it goes um, uh, beyond our uh, <laughs> um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, I mean, will to uh, be in the fashionable um, uh, movement of planting trees uh, because it's about um, restoring the whole ecosystem that was when destroyed um, uh, by um, uh, cattle uh, uh, farming. Um, and I'm saying it goes beyond planting trees because it is about, uh, it started in 2020 and we've committed to plant a million trees um, uh, but you can definitely throw a million seeds in the ground if you don't care about the seeds, they just won't grow. Uh, so it's about planting and caring. And Sebastião Salgado has beautiful words about this. He says that raising a tree is like raising a child. And that's, uh, I add my words to this. Um, this project, this collaboration uh, with Instituto Terra has fantastic, incredible results both on the ground, literally, because uh, we've restored, uh, it's been three years now, 75 million square feet of forest land. Um, and I mean, the, um, not only the trees are back, but the animals, and it's about giving back to the communities and to humanity, because rainforest is about um, uh, climate um, uh, equilibrium uh, all around the planet. And I'm um, saying that, um, and this is my word for it, where literally Zurich is mothering, uh, like women could do about um, mothering the forest, mothering the trees to make a change um, in that forest. And it might appear at, on the other side of the world, but it has concrete changes um, in our everyday life because the rain uh, drops more uh, because the heat is controlled uh, and because the habitat, the whole habitat is restored. So uh, we're mothering uh, the forest and I think it was a beautiful image and it's only the beginning uh, because it's working so well. Uh, our whole ecosystem, our business partners uh, are resonating very fantastically with this project. All Zurich employees all around the world are obviously very proud uh, and it makes um, everyone uh, uh, be a part of a concrete action that's actually changing the face of the earth. So 
Good we wife. hope it's going to spread. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that wife gives me hope today. At okay, least. thank you. Um, Ruxandra, um, what are your expectations, your hopes um, for for this sustainability uh, policy? So I'm um, I'm very lucky to be uh, in in the firm where uh, I currently am, Stepto and Johnson, because we. Uh, put a lot of emphasis on pro bono work by lawyers. Uh, and uh, again, pro bono is generally um, accepted as a need, but if it's not enforced and if it's not supported from uh, management, it's going to be uh, something that every lawyer knows they have to do, but they will not give it uh, real attention. And uh, in our firm, we have a um, percentage of our time which has to be dedicated to pro bono projects and not meeting that objective then has direct uh, consequences on the progression and on the compensation, obviously. And um, pro bono projects have to include, uh, we have a specific proportion, sorry, for um, human rights and environmental protection. And more and more in environmental protection, I see lawyers from SEPTO and Johnson, but from other firms as well, using their skills, we know the laws, we have to know the laws, we work with uh, our clients and we help them um, comply and understand those uh, laws and we have a real important role in uh, maybe uh, filling gaps uh, which exist either cross-jurisdictional or in certain jurisdictions towards, for example, protection of one project that uh, we are very involved in, endangered species, and specifically um, the animal pangolin. We've uh, worked with the international organizations to uh, to protect that. So, so I think, again, it's a combination. It's a combination of um, management uh, imposition, very specifically defined goals, and, uh, and people will actually cooperate and will be glad to do that. Thank you. So we are uh, thinking about that pro bono. It's a very important uh, topic also. Um, Claudia, um, I know you are, you are in a specific industry <laughs> and you have specific hopes. I'll let, I'll let you uh, share with the audience. Yeah, I have really specific work, specific hope, and really that's my uh, my own world. But I hope to see more girls, more women in the technical field and in STEM in, in general. <laughs> so we, uh, we we don't feel uh, we 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 don't feel alone uh, <laughs> like it is the case sometimes. But more generally, uh, I think that technical solution, and again, that's me, but I personally believe that technical solution and technologies, they're going to largely going to contribute to solving like all the environmental crises that we're facing. <laughs> of course, and a, a lot of collaboration, but um, we we need to make sure that we, we get like all the, the women's and girls' voices heard because their ideas and their perspective, and we heard it before today, that's the solution to having really creative solution, innovative solution. So we really, really need that in tackling the uh, the climate crisis. Uh, so we, we need to attract those girls, those women coming into technical careers, but also we, we need to retain them and making the the workplace a, a nice environment to uh, to be. Um, I was personally, I, I live in Canada, <laughs> and I was personally like amongst uh, 20, I think we're 20% of women to graduate from uh, engineering school, but somehow we end up being 10% in the, the workplace. I don't know the reason, and that's all personal, why all those women, they, they leave, but at the end of the day, we, we need them and we need to persevere and get them in the workforce and get them to stay in the, the workforce. So, and well, my, my hope if I, I were to resume it, and it's also personal, is that my, my own daughter gets the same opportunities, get the same chances that my son would get if she, she wants to pursue a career in, uh, in STEM and uh, in technical field, so. <laughs> Thank you so much. We have a few more minutes if we uh, do have questions in the audience. Yes? Uh, can we get a mic for the lady who are here? Thank you. 
Thank you all so much. It's a pleasure to learn from you and to hear from you. Um, I work on fundraising for the Malala Fund, working on girls' education, so I often work with corporate partners looking to make an impact in this space. My question, however, is not certainly related to that, clearly, but I did just want to ask for your perspectives. I know most of you or many of you are working in European markets, um, so I'm actually thinking about sort of the American backlash to ESG investing as a principle or framework for guiding retirement investing, things like that. We've seen three Southern American states, you know, withdraw investments from BlackRock for this reason to think about ESG as sort of a harm for retirement savings or other investment strategies. What would you say to these critics and what would you, what might you say to change their mind? Who we'll want to, to go? Well, actually, we, we, you had a point right yeah. before the, <laughs> this session, Rick so Sandra. I think we're going to let you answer. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it, it's a good question, and obviously it's uh, something which preoccupies um, both uh, public entities and uh, private companies. Um, I am I'm not American, so I'm, I'm Romanian, I'm from Europe, and I actually uh, tend to see the U.S. as a, a country in which ideas are kind of tested to see if they break or not, right? So we can um, so we can maybe see the, that uh, those backlash actions in that way. Let's see how 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 far they go and uh, and whether um, the ESG policies uh, survive. But uh, I expect that uh, the well sanity prevails possibly uh, or hopefully, and uh, I think it's a fake debate. I think uh, we are going to see more and more arguments to explain that it is a fake debate and actually investing responsibly is profitable investment. So I think the, the voices so far on or pro ESG maybe have not necessarily made that point towards how profitable it is to invest in, uh, in, with those aims in mind, and we see more and more of those. Maybe another challenge. So maybe another challenge into that direction is to reach a critical point in the volume of investment to have the uh, critical mass to make it permanent. Um, that's our goal in the insurance industry as well. Um, I mean, so that it's not criticable uh, anymore. And I think we are in the process of it. I mean, that's my optimism. <laughs> going forward on this. You want, you want to react, yes. Last question. Sure. Question, yeah, I could go on and on about ESG because <laughs> I teach this stuff, but uh, what I do want to uh, ask about recruitment and retention at law firms and at investment um, at, at the insurance companies in terms of getting the next gen of women wanting to go into law firms and into insurance, are they looking at the kinds of cases you're taking, the kind of pro bono work you're doing, and uh, the kinds, whether you're following up on your net zero commitments, I would think that this would be fantastic in terms of uh, attracting female talent and retaining female talent. I was wondering whether you could comment on that. Um, i start, yeah. yeah. So, um, I can comment from my personal perspective, but I also have uh, some industry um, data. Um, young women will look at um, gender equality parameters primarily, and they will look, as I said, very much in detail, at not only the percentage of women, but how many women partners, how many women equity partners. Um, pro bono, yes. Um, secondarily, I would say, and uh, in terms of types of cases, maybe counterintuitive, le counterintuitively, less so. Um, we see uh, industry data um, actually showing us that young lawyers will look very much just at the legal issues, so they are very excited just about the laws and not necessarily yet about certain types of, uh, of laws or practices to get in. But, uh, but I think the first... Uh, parameter that they would be looking at is uh, gender equality and what policies are applied. And again, in step though, we see that that's the first question that comes from female attorneys in particular. And we have the parameters to show just how committed the firm is. Thank it you. helps. Uh, sorry, yeah. I just thought to, to echo to, what you just said, Roxana. I think it's, it's not about in the insurance industry or 
banking, financial industry in general is not about not um, uh, attracting women um, in global percentages quite okay, it's the layers, and as much as you <laughs> go up the ladder, um, yeah, um, and, and the potential and the, I mean, how you raise the talents, um, um, uh, literally. And I would add something um, that's not very known uh, or linked to the insurance industry in particular, um, but we have more and more digitalized um, jobs and missions, scientific jobs and missions. We have risk engineers, and in risk engineers there is engineer. Um, and a very big problem um, fa when facing education, and Gabrielle uh, said the word this morning, uh, and the goal of the Women's Forum for 2023 about education, and I think scientific education for women is a one of the biggest challenges we face, I'm French, and in France, for instance, um, uh, women in math are just two <laughs> opposite words, uh, words, and it's not just possible uh, and not conceivable today. So we have to uh, promote <laughs> uh, scientific education more and more to young girls, uh, attract them to math so that they can choose um, eventually, uh, the, the career they want. Thank you so much. You can give them a round of applause. Thank you.